Good evening, people, and uh, lockdown jail inmates. Something not so pleasant this evening. During one of the interviews with Sean Atwood, um, the subject of torture came up, and I guess I started to explain it, and I'll run it now. But there's something important that we didn't quite get to at the end of that, and I'll add it when we finish that part. See you in a minute. Torture. You will have heard more gruesome stories than my own, though why you'd want to, I cannot imagine. Yet here, you will understand why it is the worst humanity can do. The thing is, if you get arrested in some place that you don't know the rules, watch a few of these things, because it'll help, honestly. Firstly, and I didn't know this, you can say what you like in a, a Pakistani police station. You can sign anything they give you to sign. It doesn't make any difference. None of it is admissible in court. Such is their record for uh, torture and duress that um, no judge there will even entertain it in the courtroom. Now, of course, yeah, you don't confess to anything which will get anybody in any trouble, but nonetheless, you have to be fearful of that. Um, but I'm holding out. Now, little do I know that old uh, Ahmed there has been told, uh, and he, he's reading of it, connections with the Russian mafia, uh, one of the families in New York City. Uh, the, yes, sort of, but not in any. Um, <clears throat> all this is getting his back up. Uh, and he said, this means nothing to us here. They have to clean this wall every day. He meant the blood that's all over it. <clears throat> and, <clears throat> you know, uh, oh, just to fill in the blank here, somebody had been arrested at an airport with a couple of kilos of heroin some weeks before, um, but that's about as much as I knew on that score. <clears throat> Now, <laughs> oh, in addition to the uh, truck battery, there are a range of interesting sticks along on, on the wall. And I'd heard stories, none of them pleasant. Um, have you ever found, Sean, that during the course of your life, you've asked yourself questions about something dire and dark and said, I wonder how I could deal with that, or I wonder what that's really like. Uh, have you? In Sheriff Joe Pyo's jail, second year, when they told me I was facing a maximum 200 year sentence, that was probably the most I was pushed to kind of a suicidal insanity questioning frame of mind. But I was thinking of those things where you ask yourself, uh, you, you're curious about something and then dismiss it by saying, well, of course, I'd never be in that situation. You know, there's people watching this who say, well, this is fine, I can click off. Uh, like, could I take a crucifixion? Um, things like that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I don't but think I could. They, you're not allowed to drink while you're up there. <laughs> they put a vinegar on a sponge and you're, you're well wishes. There was, there was an author out of Soho that. that went over and got crucified in South America or Central America. Oh. And there was a storm and lightning struck and the cross felt. <laughs> Sebastian. Fox, I think he's named Sebastian. Right. A Dandy in the Underworld is his book. It's absolutely brilliant. He's dead now. I think he owed the yeah, It's a good yeah. title. Right? It sounds yeah. worth reading. Yeah. Uh, no, well, I, I had asked myself, um, what is this about torture? Is it, is it, I know there's something bad about it, and there must be something more about it than just extreme pain and, and being tormented. After all, you hear those stories out of South America where uh, you know, uh, people you know, turn on their own children. They've been. You know, how, how does it work that uh, your mind gets warped and what is its essential evil? Good questions, perhaps. Not ones I wanted answered in, the, in what followed. So um, a, a cretinous guard came in, chained me up uh, by the hand. <clears throat> and some heavy chains, and then um, 
Oh, but Bush kind of matter-of-factly, like arranging his desk, pointed to the table. Oh, and this guard had a gun. He said, don't try anything with this guard. He's an ignorant village guy. he just shoot you. He does it all the time. I tell him off, but he doesn't listen. Um, so uh, shoes come off. Uh, they start with the canes. Now, the, the reason of the, the beating of the feet is because it doesn't show. Um, the foot doesn't show and it's bruising. So when you, uh, and that, the way it works is, I found out, um, because it's like a jolt of lightning when it hits you. Um, when that stick lands on your tendon, it tugs at all the nerves that get sent straight up the leg uh, and into the oh, into your middle. Um, and that hurt, but it was kind of like surprise, really. Um, so I started to say something to him, and the village idiot started slapping me around the head. Not too hard, but just to make the point, no, you're getting beaten now. That's what happens now. You, you don't say anything at the moment. Yeah. Um, so, and he was, he must have been a cricketer, old uh, Ahmed, because his aim for the most part during about 20 blows was pretty much in the right spot, apart from a couple of toes that he got by accident. Um, yeah, I'm thinking, uh, and you, oh, you start to scream a bit, by the way. <laughs> um, I'm thinking, okay, don't break anything because it'll take a lot of healing here. But this is a rational thought. Things start to go when it doesn't. I asked him what he wanted, got a couple of slaps, and he, he yelled out the truth. Well, that's a broad statement, isn't it? <laughs> that doesn't get us anywhere. Whack, 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 whack. So when that, uh, he, he, he paused for a bit, and, and then kind of politely said, do you, do you want a cup of tea or something? I'm thinking, all right, I'll try this. Uh, look, my family has a lot of money, and you, whack, he had a hand like a side of beef, and I'm not big. Um, so when he knocked me, I literally flew off the chair and ended up on the floor. I thought, maybe I came in too quick with the bribery or something <laughs> like that. I warmed up to it a bit, but he, he'd kind of got his own clipboard, Sean, with a, I'm, I'm going to this sort of point. And now I'm starting to remember uh, the spycraft rules of um, uh, confessions uh, under torture. You, you put up with as much as you can, then you appear to break down. Um, oh, you give one story, that's not to be believed. Then you break down and, and give you know, what's supposedly... The spycraft you know, rules of torture, did you say? Yes, yes. Um, and where did you pick those up from? Um, well, Lucari, who knows what he's talking about uh, to some extent, that's the uh, spy thriller writer, um, but also to uh, a couple of uh, scallywags I met who ended up in, in bad places. So you had pre-programmed yourself if you've ever got into this situation? Yes. Um, I thought, uh, what you, there's no avoiding, because they like to do what they do, there's no avoiding a certain amount of damage, but you, um, you don't want to lose any vital organs. So you put up with as much as you can um, until you think something's going to be irretrievably damaged. When you say you put up with as much as you can, how do you oh, mentally focus? Your, 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 your body that? tells you when um, you, you've got to get out of this. It, it's um, also, there's a very different thing here, which I'll get to in a minute. When somebody else is inflicting it upon you, it, we could probably, under some circumstances, sit here with a pair of pliers and pull one of our own teeth out because there's no anxiety. You can stop, even though it'd be you know, hugely painful. Um, you know, and you hear of those things where people have been trapped somewhere and have to chew through an arm or something to get free. You think, well, how, how could they do that? Um, you're in control. The, there is no 
customary anxiety level. But torture is a different thing, and it's to do with timing as well, uh, which I'll come to. Did you have a technique when this guy was hitting you? Like, did you go mentally somewhere else? You can't. You can't. Um, you're just there. There, you're. You learn that the part of your brain that does the talking is an independent office. It um, will um, carry out your wishes to some extent, but uh, at an animal level, all, all the true thinking is going on somewhere else. So your um, whatever is essential that you remember, yeah, that is in place. Um, but I'd spoken to a couple of people who'd been in Iran and uh, been tortured there. And you know, the funny thing was they were never quite right after that. Uh, never quite right. But this, this was just a warm up. Um, <clears throat> then when he wasn't getting anywhere um, and I was kind of developing during the break, <laughs> during the intermission, uh, oh, would you like some pound? He said, you know, it's kind of nice. Even my wife likes it. You know? uh, yeah, and this is the same guy that was doing this a few seconds ago. Um, and, you know, I'd been told it was lucky he was a professional at what he did. Um, and getting nowhere there, then the truck battery comes into play. Now, <clears throat> the thing about uh, pain is that there nothing beats electricity. Ask your pro torture, he'll tell you, Sean, no, you can pull all the fingernails out you like. Uh, when you get that juice flowing, nothing beats that. Okay. Now, I I had by then what I considered to be at the highest level of pain I could imagine of a block kidney stone. It, that sounds little, but it is extraordinarily painful. You're screaming and all of that, uh, crawling around the floor, uh, wanting to die. Uh, except strangely enough, it's your own body doing it to you. So the, there isn't this the, the key timing thing that comes up. Um, okay. Uh, there was a little bit of banter between uh, the two of them about where to put the clip. So they started off on toe on one foot, toe on another. And uh, then with the other lead, just a little intro. And that that jolt is very strong. It's got tendrils. It's got fibrous roots, that pain. It, it searches out all, all the places where your stomach and groan, a groin and uh, even your elbows for some reason and up the back of your spine to your skull. And that was just the, the touch of it. And um, uh, th then um, he, he moved, I mean, you're paying attention at this point. He, he moved the, the heavy clip around and, and it kind of caught the end of it on the, on the, the tip, uh, the nipple of his machine there. Um, and it didn't actually send any electricity through, but I, I, I jolted anyway. And, uh, oh, that got a big laugh. Oh, yes, in, in, in torturous mishaps, you know, with uh, the customer. <laughs> yeah, look at him. Yeah, we didn't yeah, do it again. See, no, he's not out. Do it real now. Uh, and then um, I don't know uh, how in, in films they show um, more than a few seconds uh, of that. You sometimes see it. I don't know. I, I can't watch those things anymore. Um, you know, some part of my brain's counting seconds. Uh, no, anyway, I, I won't watch them. Um, and you, you can't breathe, of course. Um, this, it, it, it's like, uh, like some kind of a thousand fish hooks on fire uh, uh, drawing at your very insides. Uh, and then... Um, uh, what do you want? I'm saying. I don't know what I'm saying. Uh, something or other. Just making conversation, so I'll get a bit of a break here. Uh, and so, well, you're going to tell me all of the truth. 
And I'm realizing he doesn't want to have a, a, a Q&A just at this point. He, he's got a bit more to do. Um, so then um, there's a bit of uh, experimentation where to put the clips. Uh, I wouldn't recommend the, the nipples. I mean, I've seen these kinky films. Like Some himself guy's got a nipple clamp on. What the hell is he thinking? I mean, just with the clamp alone. You certainly don't want to send like, you know, what is it, 45 amps on a truck battery or more. It's the amperage that counts. It's not the voltage, guys. <laughs> I must confess, there was a time in my life when I did own a vibrating nipple clamps. <laughs> what made me not surprised? <laughs> yes, well, whatever works. It's funny how we go through in phases in our life with these things, you know? What you might have done 20 years ago, you probably... I'm normal now. <laughs> That's normal, not on planet Earth, but that is on... Um, <laughs> Venusia Plus. Mm. So here's where I learnt uh, a bit more about all of that. Uh, okay, I've got... Um, when, when he stops to take a couple of phone calls or something, um, he barely listens because they don't really want to know anything terribly much. They're not interested. Um uh, he says, that's not the truth, and uh, and you know it. Well, I know he's not going to believe that one. So I get um, taken back to the cell, and I start to notice even things like a big hanging bar in the, in the middle uh, of the corridor there that's for stringing people up. And um, there's a Spanish word for hanging somebody in a, with their arms backwards, isn't there? I forget what it is. Uh, trapezo or something. Anyway, uh, this is this is what gets you. It's the waiting for the next session. I was in that cell, and it's a a suicide proof cell. And it's nothing in it. Um, you, it's a myth. You can swallow your tongue. It's a uh, you, you need you need some device. You need something. Um, I don't know, uh, I don't know, swallow your clothes? I don't know, don't know. didn't have my boots anyway. Um, now, as you can imagine, my ear is stuck to the crack in that cell door, and every s footfall, every scrape, every person, I'm judging it, are they slowing down? Are they coming to my door? I hear keys jangling. Is it my door that's going to be opened? Um, because uh, he took me back, uh, had a little bit more, mostly just slapped me around. Um, but he, he was tied up with something else. But I, I knew, he you know, was we saying all those things. They said, we'll really get started when you get back again. Um, <laughs> it, I came to have really most of my questions about what torture is uh, and, and what's going on and why it's bad. What is happening is as we, we become who we are by our brain responding to uh, uh, the DNA, of course, but also our life's experiences and it wires itself a particular way. This repeated torture sessions utterly rewire that brain. Mm -hmm. I would imagine fate intervened and things weren't so bad. I had a bit of luck. But I know that um, somebody who, you can imagine the poor bastards that are, go through uh, daily torture. Uh, think of Pol Pot's regime in Cambodia. They had a, a, a mattress. Uh, it wasn't a mattress, it was a bed frame. And that the whole thing was wired up and they used to throw water over people and, and charge them. That, they, it, it's worse than killing somebody. A, a torturer is worse than a murderer because what he's doing is rewiring that person's brain, creating some hideous deformed creature from within that will never 
be able to experience or, or see the world in any way again without that distortion of fear. Uh, and it's the timing that particularly does that. Every so, event is loaded. So does describing this then take you to that place? I've had some kind of distance from it, but I know that it's still there. If I hadn't have been saved by uh, a chance uh, intervention, then um, uh, I could have ended up rewired to, uh, I don't know what I've been, it would have been a shuffling wreck, uh, fearful of something, phobic about something. Um, but I know when I sleep, uh, that the dreams that I have uh, always are some kind of a prison. If I fail to make clear why torture is evil, then I need to do better. If I succeeded, then you have solid empathy. I was with Sean Atwood. In the interview, there's a very important point that I didn't quite reach. Oh, I, I guess I was burdened by the idea that um, people wouldn't focus on this idea of creating a creature within the brain by rewiring it. And here's how it actually works. Sure, there are, well, some amongst us, uh, I like to think quite a few, who can take mistreatment from another, um, can actually survive the torture mostly by treating it as one event, a horrible event. Yeah, sure, some people are traumatized for life, though I think that bears examination. I'm not too sure how we'd all get through our childhoods otherwise. Really, torture works by a special command of time. For me, in Karachi, I was lucky, very lucky, in one sense, that the torture didn't actually take deep hold. And here's why. It was prevented for more than, well, really two sessions, but it was a glimpse and an understanding enough. I'll explain. For torture to have the long-lasting and irredeemable effect that I was alluding to, it has to be repeated. I'll put you in the scene. As horrible as being charged with electricity was, what seemed to be worse was after I was put back in the cell, expecting more because that's the key. I was told, we'll talk to you again when you're a bit more cooperative. So here's the thing. I was in that cell, walking around in circles. I knew that the guard who came from me, would come for me, would have his keys. So pretty quickly, I worked out what the sound was of his keys coming to my door. But there were others, so I could be mistaken. I had my face pressed up, or my ear really, pressed up against the crack in the, the cell door. It wasn't the kind that had bars you could see through. It was just a, a, a concrete room with lots of spit in it and God knows what else. But the door itself was solid steel. I think it had a little um, eye hole thing in it, um, tradition something from the British um, architects of prison, prisons, I suppose. After a couple of sessions, the sound of the guard coming for me was very distinctive. I could hear his particular shuffle, the sound of his scuffed leather shoes scraping on the concrete, the grit on the concrete. You become very good at this when you know that if the sound is not in your favour and he's coming for you, then a session starts. Somehow the anticipation of it, it's, that's the thing that does the rewiring. It's really harder, almost. No, I can't really say it's harder to put up with the anticipation. It's not. But you know something dark is going on within your brain. You cannot live with it. If there was a button there that would end your life, you'd surely press it. At one stage, I remember I'd had a pencil sharpener somewhere in my luggage. I didn't have it with me, but I was seeing that pencil sharpener, and I wondered, 
Would it actually kill me if I took out the blade? No. I'd have to be lucky for that. Very lucky. Anyway, it turned out I couldn't get the damn blade out properly. That was on another occasion. But here in the timing again. If you survive some horrific torture event, and it's a single event, you have lots of means of dealing with it. Oh, sure, it lasts and stays there, but you can because it's somehow isolated. It's this timing thing, the repetition, the knowledge that they're coming for you again. Now, I'm sure in probably some of the worst of it in uh, um, Cambodia or the South American prisons under the dictatorships, People knew their jailers. They knew the sound of somebody coming towards them. Perhaps like I did when I had my ear pressed to the metal of that door. You know, sometimes I'd be wrong and he'd scrape past and go on to somebody else. The clanging keys on a ring at his belt clip. I knew when they'd be taken off that clip and that would tell me something. It would be another cell. People were silent in those cells. They didn't talk to each other. Um, It wouldn't have cheered them up. They weren't in the mood for it, I can tell you that. So when you get taken back in, you, of course, start to deal with it. You look at your torture and see what sort of mood he's in, and then, then it is. But I know for sure it's the timing that makes all the difference. Here's the thing, when... People have had it done to them day after day, um, different sessions, different times, at any time of the day or night. It could be four in the morning they come for them. They know all these things. This is when the most horrific rewiring takes place. The only way your brain can deal with it, it's not actually dealing with it. It's creating a separate creature, this homunculus, that little kind of devilish imp that was grown inside some people in, uh, I think it was a Middle Ages concept, but probably earlier. But that's what it felt like, that there was something ready to be moved in. Those poor devils in the South American prisons who are taken out and electricity is used and used and used until they are nothing, until they are just reduced to some dual creature jumping at everything. How do they see their treatment? Well, perhaps they see it differently because they are no longer themselves. But I had the slightest taste of it, just a taste, as my torturer was fonder of uh, pointing out later to the liaison officer who came and plucked me out of there. Well, not out of there, but out of the torturer's particular hands. Just a taste of it, but enough to understand why I still regard the torturer as the most evil of people. Worse than some science fiction villain. Worse than the Borg who take over people's minds, because do they want to create a a fearful, quivering wreck that's inside people's brains? No, really, in all of fiction, you can't get that. Now the torturer knows this. The torturer knows that he will create something that is inhuman. Now, by contrast, a murderer uh, probably pales into insignificance, I would say. Of course, there are torturers in the civilian world, and they deserve that special place in hell as well. But for those of you who might be fond of dismissing the idea, think about what has made you and me and everybody else. It's a repetition of learning. It's the creator. Finally, there are some who argue there are circumstances where torture is uh, justified. They always seem to pick on this idea of the ticking bomb. You have the terrorist, you know, he has the information as to where the time device is about to go off or his uh, comrades who are about to do it, so that 
any form of mistreatment is warranted. Well, <clears throat> I suppose we can all create some fantasy scenario where, I don't know, somebody in your family is in a box somewhere with a limited amount of air, and you have the person in, who knows the location. Indeed, I would do what be, would be necessary to get that information. But here's the difference. It doesn't... It makes you a, a ruthless person, but a torture is something different. You're not keeping that scumbag locked up in a cell and going back and doing the same thing to him every day until he's just a shred. No. It's quite different. And so the people who justify it on the ticking bomb scenario don't have any understanding of what it's all about. And they don't know what sin there is in creating a human crafted out of fear.